My name is Stefan Heller. I'm one of the founding partners of AQVC. Um, we started AQVC um, and went live last year with the vision to democratize venture capital. Uh, our core product is an innovative fund of fund. It's a semi-liquid evergreen structure, mostly tailored to family offices and also institutional investors who want to tap into venture capital, who want a diversified portfolio, access to early stage, access to exciting new technologies around the world, so also in emerging markets, and the whole thing with a strong partnership in mind. And Chris is one of our investors. Um, maybe before we head off into some questions, Chris, quick introduction from your side. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, first of all, for your time and the idea of the webinar, I really like the format. So uh, my name is Christoph Roos. I um, am working as part of the management board of G Ventures and based in Zurich. So nice, yeah. Uh, your sorry, background Chris, information might, you. might might be might be useful as well. So how do you how do you get uh, to to a family office? So um, I started my career originally in the private banking and corporate banking space. Uh, in Germany, um, after I've seen that space for quite some years, uh, I decided after I did my studies in Germany and abroad to uh, work in uh, East Africa for an, um, a merger project in microfinance sector, which was two and a half years, so roughly 2016 to late 2018. And after that, I really uh, wanted to get further into the venture MPE space. So um, I'm now working in this whole sector basically for four years. And with GE, uh, three years now. Great. Well, Chris, um, before we dive deeper also into your career and what you're doing actually with uh, GE Ventures or the family office behind it, a quick reminder to the audience, uh, this is a live webinar also for you to ask questions. So please use the chat um, or the Q&A feature of Zoom. So if you look at the um the bottom of the zoom menu you have a q a where you can post questions we are actively reading that um so uh, if you have any questions please 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 let us know um i think you um, you should be able to see um the chat and um yeah then let's let's continue down the journey i mean chris you mentioned sort of how you got started and 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 your road to GE Ventures, maybe tell us a little bit about it. I mean, we wrote a bit about in the announcement, but give us some background on what does GE Ventures do, the family office behind it, and also your investment strategy. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Stefan. So GE Ventures um, is the investment arm of Global Eye Capital, which is based in Zurich. Um, we have, in general, I would say an approach for direct investments. That's our focus. Um, we invest uh, mainly in a proximity around um, Zurich. So anything in the, the German market is great. So basically German speaking Dach region, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Um, and um, we like tech in general. So we, we have a, a strong, let's say IP driven approach for our investments uh, over all stages. We are quite agnostic regarding the stage. Um, on top of that, very relationship driven. So at the end of the day, most of the things that we have a closer look at are coming from our network. So um, normally there is some kind of relation already on the family office base uh, or um, on the, let's say, side of the employees who uh, have some, let's say, startup maybe in their direct proximity, which is very appealing. So ETH Zurich is, of, of course, a great source for new projects. But uh, also in Germany, we have quite some, some interesting projects which we are looking at and also actively investing. And um, nice. I would say we, it's also important to be balanced, right? So we, we have uh, next to our VC and uh, PE portfolio, we do real estate, which is, I think, uh, at the moment very exciting because of the, uh, the, the interest rate situation. So there is a lot of movement in the space. Um, if you if you are a cash buyer, then you can definitely have some some good deals there as well. But also, um, I'm super um, bullish for the VC space. So there is a lot going on, and uh, I think we are in an exciting time. Obviously, couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> but this isn't a market uh, webinar on the on the opportunities we see right now alone in VC. But it's more about maybe the, you mentioned the relationship, right? I think this is obviously as a source of deal flow, it's hugely important to have access to the best deals. Yeah. And I mean, doesn't mean you 
need to do every deal, but at least have a look and are early in the in the chain of who gets asked. Very yeah. often we see in the family office investor space that they are kind of the investor of last resort. Yeah, so very often they see the deal after many VCs have already passed on the deal. What do you see? How is this working for you? Or how do you see this relationship game going versus you're the first one to be mm. looked at or looking at a deal versus you're you know, kind of the last one maybe having to catch the falling knife? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, luckily, we do have some experienced uh, people also from the VC space who, who know how to source those deals, but also to analyze them. So, of course, our network is relevant. So also you guys uh, from AKVC, I think the idea of sourcing funds via basically a filter, because you do your own filtering for AKVC. So you, you have a look about at which funds are performing the best and in these funds are assets which are very promising so normally that's a filter criteria that is really helpful um, but also from our side so we 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 like to be sometimes a bit bold so we we also uh, prefer early deals where we have a certain angle for the founder so if we for instance are convinced of the founder personality and i think it's mostly about the personality and the business plan. It's neither nor, it has to be both, but I think it's very important that somebody is a fighter and doesn't give up. So we, because, you know, sometimes a startup starts with one idea and then it evolves into several directions. And uh, if somebody is in general, um, I would say achieving things, then uh, there is always a way forward as long as you don't give up. So we, we really have a close look, what did the person do before, before they set up the new uh, venture, for instance, uh, and, did they have an exit? Uh, what was their track record so far? Because normally, I mean, do you always say in this business that track record uh, or let's say past results are not promising the future, but there is an indication. There is a definitely a correlation between the past results and uh, the current situation and the future. No, 100%. And I think, I mean, this is for venture. It's so important to look at uh, people at the end of the day. Um, where who's ex, who's who can go the extra mile, right? It's one it's one thing to look at it on startups, right? I was a serial entrepreneur before. Uh, AQVC is is a fund of fund, but it's almost like a startup, the entrepreneurial. And we yeah. look at this when we invest in fund managers, right? From our portfolio strategy, we focus on early stage because I think we can really leverage that early stage pre-seed to late Series A uh, investing. For mm -hmm. larger family offices like yourself who have the capability to do direct investing and co-investing in, in later rounds and actually be a real alternative to founders to later stage and growth stage funds. Um, but you need deal flow. And this is, I think, where, where we come in. And very often this deal flow and the funds that we invest into are not just the established tier one brands because they also get old yeah and they're especially i think track record if you have a track record and for example e-commerce in germany over the last 10 15 years doesn't yeah. mean you will be a great investor in the next decade where well. technology <laughs> has shifted yeah it's, it's about deep tech hard, hardware it's biotech it's it's super frontier technologies or former frontier technologies that are now moving into the mainstream um, where we are focusing in, on and these emerging managers very often that focus and are specialized on these sectors um, you know they have a track record maybe working at a large firm they do a spin out and they set up their much smaller much more exciting fund uh, and this is where I think we can we can be great partners to you and provide you with with exciting uh, co and direct investment opportunities. Oh, that's a fact. And also, I, I think um, there is a saying, focus on risks. I mean, in the VC space, it's really hard to focus on risk. But even there, you can have, let's say, a right or wrong approach. So if you are bold and go in early, at least you have an idea how much uh, burn rate will you have. Like, is there, for instance, if it's a software related business, we like SaaS, for instance, um, how much money will be burned until you, you see a significant uh, outcome? Because mm -hmm. in some cases, uh, just look at some of the, the really, let's say, big uh, IPOs or also um, private companies that, that have been struggling for years. Uh, in hindsight, Amazon was a great idea. And of course, it worked out. But to be honest, without the funding, they would not have gotten to the result where they are today. So at the end of the day, it's always a question, do you get enough firepower to, to keep on going also against the competition? Or will you at one point in time have to stop because there is no more funding? 
So um, I, we like also small ideas that have, let's say, a limited amount of growth. So that doesn't have to be necessarily a big IPO player for Nasdaq or something. Can be. But uh, even if it's something that, let's say, we have an entry valuation of 10, 20 million and can uh, exit at 100 million plus, that's a great deal, right? So it's, mm. it's maybe not like a 100x result, but it's, it's good enough to uh, be happy with. So be better to make a smaller investment with a higher level of confidence than something where also the risk is substantially higher. Yeah, 100%, right? But if you look at venture, it's an outlier business. So at the earlier stages, if you invest pre C, C, even early A, like European A's, yeah? um, these companies rarely have product market fit. Rarely, right? There are always sometimes these really special cases. But in most cases, there is still a very high risk. And, and then for a fund, usually, if these companies would exit at a sub 100 million valuation, that usually does not work with the fund economics. Yeah, it depends a bit on the fund size. Yeah, with like 10 to 30 million funds, it might work. But with the normal, you know, 75 to 150 million funds, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, if these are the normal outcomes. Yeah. So you need these outliers. But for a family office, again, to tap into these outliers, I think is, is, is very difficult, right? You you usually don't have that kind of deal flow. Um, which are normally the stages that you would really look at, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we are. I mean, we are quite agnostic. So once we we see, okay, there is a certain traction. So of, we do invest pre revenue, for instance. Mm -hmm. That's that's something we do. But we still want to see at least that the stars are already aligned in a way, right? So just like based on an idea and a pitch deck is not enough so uh, i mean from from series a plus uh, it, it makes sense to have a closer look um luckily we we had i think some some good hits uh, in our portfolio where we uh, had the, the right gut feeling for the for the people involved um and um so but there is no guarantee for that right so you you always have hmm. to be a bit careful uh where you say yes or no and based on like the number of pitches that you receive, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you get hundreds of uh, pitch decks per year. Yeah. And you have a look at them, yes. And uh, you definitely check them for, for let's say, a, a certain viability. But you will only do a handful of deals, like maybe five, seven, eight in our case. Uh, that, that would be the, the realistic amount. Yeah, I mean, five to seven deals is, I, I think it's a lot, right? Uh, to be honest, you need to have the right setup. I mean, you, you, guys are relatively large from a setup standpoint i think you have about 15 um investments um uh, portfolio yeah. companies right yeah. um is there anything that really stands out right you mentioned this long-term partnership right how 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 do you do this as a family office right versus like normally a fund who also you know say the same thing sometimes uh, because obviously as a founder and especially if you're a founder with some traction you can choose the investors right why would they partner with you and 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 not somebody else. I think uh, that's a big advantage if you are a family office, then you are only basically reporting to, to the principal family. And uh, if there is patience, then you also have patience for the portfolio. That's a big advantage. So for instance, we have uh, one of our companies, uh, which has seen already quite some way, which was uh, founded over 10 years ago um, called SkyCell. Mm, where the first years were a lot of R and D, uh, and impatient investors would have asked, "Okay, when when do the when do the revenues come, and when when do we have a positive uh, EBITDA?" But for some good things, especially very IP driven things, and this is one example for uh, a very IP intense and capital intense uh, company. I mean, they have they have raised uh, over a hundred million so um, over the years. Um, first of all, you got to do this. Then you need the product. You need to get into the, the sales cycle yeah. because in this case we are talking about um, pharmaceutical products, so air freight via pharmaceutical uh, for pharmaceutical products, and um, it's a very specific business. It's a super interesting niche, but at the other hand, it's also something where you need incredible patience for the first years. Now the, the traction is great, so the last years uh, over fifty percent growth per annum, but in the first years you really you need to be patient and. Uh, also in, in a certain goodwill. And uh, from a fund perspective, not every fund has 10 plus years, right? Sometimes 10 years is what, what you want to have until the exit, but not actually uh, still in the middle of the game, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, right? I think, I mean, we are an evergreen, right? For us, it's a bit unique because I think as a, 
as a fund of fund or the biggest way or the best way of diversification in venture is vintage diversification, right? And so that's why we believe closed ended fund of funds, you don't really get the most important diversification, right? If you look at on a per vintage basis, yes. you need about 15 funds and anything above that statistically, at least you start to get over diversified almost. Yeah, so it depends a little bit if you invest globally or Europe only, et cetera. But if you look at it on a yearly basis, more than 15 fund investments per year starts to get critical, right? Uh, or you need to have a specialized strategy around it. But if you look at it over time, that's actually where the diversification comes in. And so this is why we think a an evergreen fund of fund makes a, a, a ton of sense, yeah? yeah. Versus a, yeah. like if you are a direct investing fund, an evergreen again becomes more difficult. Yes, the startups might take longer, and maybe 10 years isn't the best time. You know, look at, there was a, uh, in the All In podcast, they discussed SoftBank and Division Fund as a structure. If Division mm. Fund would have had a 20 year life cycle and wouldn't have forced some of these companies to IPOs uh, so quickly, um, maybe the outcome would have been different, right? There's a lot of, you know, crystal ball discussion around this. Um, but I think there needs to be a structure in place that has a fixed end, right? Because otherwise, you know, the startups aren't driven to growth. And this is, I think, where the essence of venture lies, right? You want to have growth companies with sustainable yeah. growth, but still significant, right? This is, I think, the, the, the difficult part to find that. Definitely. I think like the liquidity component of AQVC is something that I personally really like uh, because it's, it's something which is outstanding. It's not common in the industry. And uh, makes total sense from an investor perspective, right? To uh, to have a certain, let's say, option to to exit after maybe just like four or five years instead of ten, because you need the money for whatever reason. Uh, yeah. I think if it comes to direct investments, the check size should be adequate to also be able to wait a little longer, uh, because in some cases you you might necessarily have to wait, right? There is there is no way around. I know plenty of companies where you say, oh yes, IRR is 10, 20 percent or even more, but doesn't mean that they have this on a per annum basis. It's not like this. It's more like this, right? So it's of definitely course. something which is uh, sometimes very volatile. Sometimes even you have a down round in between, and then you have a very good up round, uh, depending on the market. So yeah, I think this is. With venture being so long term, and especially look at the, the time we're in right now, there are almost no exits, right? Very dry IPO markets. There's a little bit of an MA, but I think everybody is at least on the, the early signals are there that we have hit rock bottom, right? That now it's slowly starting to look better. There, there are acquisitions. Uh, tech stocks are performing quite well again. Um, so there is a certain movement in the market that makes everyone in the VC ecosystem feel bullish, but obviously in the long term, right? If you look at it from a, and this is so difficult for us, for us humans in general, I think, yeah? yes, if you look at it for the next 10 years, the opportunities are huge, right? And I think this is where long-term patient investors like family officers come in. And I mean, the story you talked about at SkySell sounds fantastic, right? You've, you've partnered with them for a very long time and it sounds like, the company is doing fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, they um, they have seen really good years now and are on a, on a great path. So we have reached back even now. Um, the company basically has also now just recently, a couple of days ago, signed um, a serious uh, anchor investor for the, the Series D, which is the last round before the IPO. So we are planning an IPO in roughly two years. Fingers crossed. Yes, fingers crossed for the IPO window <laughs> also, I agree. Um, but uh, I think for a good company with also nice margins and a great perspective, there is always a way. And even if it's a strategic investor who puts like triple the money on the table, nobody will be sad about that, right? So um, I'm, I'm thinking this is a good example for a company where you need time to really um, execute the business plan. Because yeah. in this segment, just to give you a uh, rough idea, so why uh, is it, for instance, relevant to have a certain substantial size in this market? First of all, you need to work on the client relations, which are big pharma in this case. So having 16 out of the 20 big pharma corporations um, globally, to get into them takes really long time. This can be like two years yeah. cycle, even longer sometimes. And on top of that, you have to consider um, that the number of containers in this case that are being built and rented. So first of all, you need to develop them. 
Geisel is using a, a unique technology that is uh, very sustainable using less carbon dioxide uh, than the market standard and also is uh, very durable. So very good unit economics. These unit economics, you will see once you have a certain fleet size. So because the relocation costs of the containers become less over time, and then the margin increases substantially. And you have to wait for this moment to come, right? You, you cannot have a look at it like three years ago. You have to compare really what is the J-curve looking like? Where will you be at one point in time? It's a little bit like, like any business that needs a certain scale to become really interesting. Mm -hmm. This is a very good example for it. On top of that, cold chain as a market is growing. So we expect a doubling of the market until 2030. Why? Because all pharmaceutical products have to be cooled in a way. So even if it's just fridge temperature, but even that is some cooling, right? So not maybe not uh, at a deep stage where you uh, are way below minus the, uh, zero degrees, but you have to still get uh, a temperature which you will not have somewhere on the tarmac if you are flying a container to Singapore. And the good thing about SkySail is that the containers have 100% stable temperature. So there is no uh, significant default rate. And that's very appealing to a pharma client because, I mean, obviously, pharma cargo can be very costly and you don't mm -hmm. want to uh, dispose it. And um, yeah, so we, this is one of the big hits where we are really happy uh, about our. Uh, decision to to cooperate and uh it's it's on a on a partnership level uh where the families are also very close to each other and um we are happy about that sounds sounds fantastic sadly we only invest in early stage funds but this is a <laughs> this sounds like a great deal and this is exactly what i mean right that family offices like you talked about a series d right here with sky sir right this at this level right it's so interesting. Once the companies emerge with product market fit, the companies are reaching unit economic profitability or even break even, then really the sources of capital become like there's so many different sources of capital, right? I really think that there's there's so many different alternatives to founders out there. Um, and it's not always just the traditional growth funds, uh, late stage funds out there. But family offices, especially large ones that are really sophisticated with dedicated teams, can be serious alternatives to um, to traditional funds. Definitely, I think it's it's a different audience, right? Like over time, when a company matures, you will not have um, venture returns, but you will also not have the venture risk. So at the end of the day, yeah. it's, it's still great to make 20, 30, 40 percent uh, IRR. Uh, you will not make 100x or like 20, 30x. That's not possible, but you will definitely uh, have a nice result. And I think many family offices come more from a perspective of uh, wealth conservation. Uh, so it's not about yeah. necessarily growing it after the inflation rate. Um, for a family office like this, a similar venture is definitely more appealing than a high risk um, option. Yeah. No, I mean, you, 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 this is, I think, a very interesting topic you go down is what is a family office set up to do? Yeah, in most cases, it's wealth preservation, right? It's not really um, taking high risk, taking high risk bets. And that's very often what we see when we partner with funds and we also help them with our own experience, right? Because I mean, you mentioned long sales cycles, fundraising and building a new fund as an emerging manager, um, uh, talk about long sales cycles and being brutal, right? This is, is this, uh, yeah, right now, very, very tough. Um, but it's rewarding if you partner with the right people. And, and, and there it's exactly that, right? Understanding your the partnership, right? What is the investor really looking for? Is it just returns or is it returns plus, right? What is the plus that a fund is offering to you or could offer to you that you uh, personally or with the family office would be looking at or would be interesting to you? I mean, deal sourcing, that's, that's one of the topics that I mentioned at the beginning uh, is, is great because if you are already um, in the fund, then of course you also get sometimes a visibility of the underlying companies in the sub funds. Um, that's, that's one thing which is great because it will save you at least a certain level of due diligence, maybe even a lot mm -hmm. if you do it smart and get access to some due diligence documents. Um, <clears throat> but on top of that, I think you are, I mean, what I like about you guys, for instance, you, you come from the industry, you are 
from venture. So you have your own experience with venture, with fundraising. You know how hard it can be as a founder. You have done exits. And uh, so you you understand the game inside out. At the end of the day, it's a game. I mean, the whole the whole life is a stage in a way. And also the VC space is about getting capital convinced to enter around at a certain price and then to get it from there to the next step and the next step and the next step. Yeah. And uh, I think for a family office, I mean, if you do not have the resources to necessarily do a deep due diligence uh, for single deals, for instance, then a fund or a fund of fund makes total sense because you, you will still get handsome results way above inflation rate, uh, but don't have the headache. First of all, you have the diversification, which I like. Secondly, you don't have the headache. Yeah. You don't have the headache. That uh, should be the new tagline. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, after last year, I would say headache is 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 still the buzzword sometimes. So a headache, I've seen yeah. headache in many in many other cases. Like if if you go for the wrong uh, single investment, can also go south, right? So I mean, talking talking Plata and, and others, for instance, uh, there are examples for down routes that that are really massive. And uh, the question is, where, where was your entry point? And diversification. Yeah. Because if you have just like a couple percent, then it's not harming you too much. Um, but uh, what I like actually, um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of Warren Buffett quotes, but this one I like. I mean, if you are really 100% convinced of a business because you have a certain uh, insight of what they are doing and you know more than the market, then you can go also not all in maybe, but you can really buy a significant chunk. So his strategy, for instance, has shown in the, in the last 30, 40 years or longer even that if you can go for something totally simple, but reliable and scalable, you will still get to a very handsome yeah. result at the end of the day. So deep yeah. tech, I personally, I like deep tech and I think tech is super fascinating. Also the whole, whole AI movement. But um, you need the right people to assess it. And it's definitely not easy yes. to assess like the value drivers in this case. Yeah, we, we agree, right? Obviously, we, with our investment strategy, we focus on these um, more complicated areas because I think this is also where the diversification, the access, the understanding, the selection, all of the benefits we are trying to provide to our investors really play out because if you say, okay, we're going to invest in Tiger Global Core to whatever big branded fund, X brand fund with multiple billions AUM. I don't know if that's so challenging, right? Every wealth manager, every bank that is uh, trying to sell to you will probably sell you access to these to these funds. Um, so yeah, coming to your point there on, on, on some of these direct investments that also didn't work out well, right? When we, when we started the idea for AQVC three years ago, we were obviously at the peak of the bubble and the initial market sounding we were doing, a lot of the family offices, they were like, no, we only do direct investing. I just invested 20 million into Klarna at a 40 billion valuation. Mm -hmm. And they were super proud of getting into these companies. I'm not saying these are bad companies, right? I, I, I really admire these companies. And I think it's great also for the European ecosystem. If some of these, uh, like uh, what, what are the decacorns, Will come back and work out at the end but for yeah. some investors definitely they they you know bought into expensive and i think this is coming back to doing your homework looking at what you understand looking what your strength is as a family office to your warren buffett quote it it needs to be simple or you need to understand it or have the right partners uh like a fund of fund yeah exactly no, I mean, uh, exactly what, what you say. It's it's also about, you have to know your limits, right? So I think we, we have, for instance, also a, quite a good insight into uh, the German real estate market. Um, and uh, therefore, we, we like to invest there, especially right now. Um, if you don't have that access, you, you better don't do it. Otherwise, you might be one of the people who uh, will not make it. So I've, I've seen some... Uh, Bad stories now of, let's say, larger investors uh, who were basically over leveraged uh, in, in a situation where interest rates are spiking. And that, that can be very unpleasant for your portfolio. Some, some have if, to even like liquidate uh, the whole portfolio, like the whole real estate portfolio, because they cannot pay the interest anymore. And um, I, yeah, it's, it's difficult times in, in real estate. We are not experts in that. We only speak for venture and their specifically for early stage venture, which is our area of expertise. But an investor of ours last week told me in a call that the real estate market is like Mordor right now. Yeah. So you, you, you'll have a lot of burning buildings and orcs <laughs> and it's, it's yeah, 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 it will be tough. Yeah. We'll see. 
what is interesting <laughs> by the way, was what, what you said uh, about about venture i think um the the good companies still have uh, a fair valuation but uh basically similar growth rates like before so if you really just look at it with hard facts at the moment to enter venture is a very good time right as you said because the valuations are quite low and you can enter at a very appealing valuation but doesn't mean that you will not be successful on uh, over let's say five years you can just have a really good entry point because at the time when money was free i mean if you pay zero percent interest rate or close to it then some projects got funding at high valuations that were not deserving it and some funds of course had it then as part of their portfolio which they now see so i think it's it's already a very good job if you can avoid to uh, get into funds that are having maybe less than one x after a couple of years because they went for the wrong yeah. one Especially the yeah the, hype, the stuff which was too much hyped. Oh, this is especially true for established firms. So when we look at it from an investment uh, committee standpoint, yeah, the emerging managers there we look at the potential of the manager of the technology that the, the, the startup connections they're having, also their track record, obviously. But it's less relevant for for that specific fund because it's usually a new fund, yeah. With established firms, if you have a VC fund that has been around for over 10 years and your fund one that was established maybe 2011, 2012, yeah. doesn't even have one X DPI. Yeah, we're coming out of the period. Yes, the valuations were crazy high, but it was also the period with the biggest exits, IPOs, banks, sure. all the craziness you can imagine. And if you didn't manage to create at least one X DPI for your investors after more than 10 years in a fund life cycle, then um, we are at least skeptical. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's going to be a very tough decision for us to uh, invest and in. highly likely it will be a no. Yeah, and I think looking at that, these different metrics, yeah, uh, obviously venture is always based on fantasy valuations. So you need to look at the DPI, you need to look at the long-term potential, but also sometimes look at the structures of the rounds. Yeah, I think this is also something that not a lot of people that are not experts in venture know about or even look at, to be honest, is, okay, the valuations went up uh, or maybe stayed the same, but what are the lick prefs? What, how much does the, what, what does the waterfall actually look of the value drivers in the portfolio until mm -hmm. when does the fund or even I return any kind of capital? Yeah? And then you start to paint a totally different picture very often uh, versus just looking at percentage ownership of a highly valued company. Yeah. Yes, that's true, yeah, that's true. Uh, How do you I see this you... structured rounds in, in, in the current market? Well, I mean, it's always a, a matter of negotiation, how, how you can can put yourself, but uh, this is definitely one of the important aspects. If you if you go for for direct deals, you you know you need to know how uh, like this also works, and uh, the waterfall is definitely a part of it. Uh, at the end of the day, if a company is is succeeding, then this is maybe not a, a major point to look at. But if you are doubting the traction and also like the execution of the business plan, then definitely you should have covered your risks. But what you guys yeah. do, I mean, you also do secondaries, right? So you buy also in secondaries of funds where you yeah. get sometimes really nice discounts. This is also a really nice model, what I like about it. Yeah, we've just called, we're just in the process to complete three secondary deals. Um, we've been looking at, I think by now we looked at over 40 secondary opportunities, LP led secondaries where LPs either need to get liquidity because of denominator effects uh, and other cash flow reasons. Yes. Um, but but the the pricings didn't manifest yet yeah when you look at the valuations of the underlying companies they weren't marked down we couldn't have really a pricing discussion that that was fair yeah and so right now we are seeing a lot of opportunities there that i think from our again strategy and investment strategy are very beneficial to our investors where you have a blend of primaries like new funds that are just mm -hmm. starting to invest but their companies will take a long time uh, to to really get to maturity and also buying into secondaries that are very well priced uh, right now where once the ipo markets come back the same i guess is true for sky cell um, you will see meaningful significant exits again absolutely but what was like the, the the average discount that you could get for for secondary so far where you were discussing at least that what's what's the average 
it, it depends, I guess, uh, between 40 and 60 percent, right? I think this is sort of the range we are we are looking at right now. Talking about then of from, from the top, right? So if, if you are talking also about then some yeah. of the bubble valuations that will maybe come back, I'm not saying they won't come back, but it will take some time. It will take time for sure. Um, I mean, different question now from the audience. Uh, somebody asked a very good question about the European ESG regulation, how that impacted your approach to investing. And if yes, uh, how? I would say we definitely um, look at sustainable business models. So um, for instance, ESG, in case of SkyCell, to, to, uh, to circle back on that one, uh, we have the, um, the health pillar angle. And of course, we do have also the CO2 emission angle. So those aspects are very important and significant, I think, uh, because SkyCell mm -hmm. also, although it is not a, a main driver of the turnover, but SkyCell has also played an important role in um, vaccine distribution um, during COVID. Um, although the market as such is growing and there are a lot of clients who still need these kind of services, but uh, still somebody has to do it, right? So if, for instance, uh, via um, Dubai and, and other remote places, you can even fly to African countries. And uh, I think that was a really important part. We, for instance, uh, also due to ESG, we have invested into um, Greenforce. So Greenforce is a... Mm -hmm. A food tech startup from from Munich. I guess I guess you know them um, as you live there, <laughs> right? As, at least for now. Um, so they they have, in my point of view, uh, a really interesting concept because first of all, uh, it's based on killing less animals, which I personally can support, and it's also good for the uh, for the whole ecosystem to uh, have less um, land use and less carbon dioxide emissions, less water usage. So that that makes total sense, first of all, and secondly. Um, it's also an interesting business model because some of the, the big players, the, the first uh, movers, they have, I wouldn't say failed, but they have done mistakes. And if you are now doing it right, you can build up a company in a growing market with avoiding the mistakes uh, that other people did. So ESG definitely is an important component for us. I think it's a, it's an, it's a value add. So we, we definitely consider impact as uh, part of our investment strategy. Um, but it still also, of course, has to fit some ROI criteria. So it has to, at the end of the day, it has to work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for us, I mean, ESG is obviously, yes, there's the regulation around it, the reporting around it. But in general, if you look at it from a broader sense, what, what are we investing into? I think when you look at what we discussed earlier, where does a fund of fund make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense in the, in the, in the, in the complicated uh, parts because there you can really leverage the diversification yeah if it's if it's very easy you can do it yourself highly likely um to understand and there in, in climate tech investing and climate tech is something that is 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 not one sector it is like software right there was this one quote uh i don't know chris you remembered software will eat the world right i think this is still true software is continuing to eat the world but mm. climate will also continue to eat tech investing because at the end of the day it doesn't matter where you start, every single industry from automotive to industry to, to travel, everything has a climate footprint, everything has a climate impact, and everything is more and more driven by technology. So that's where we believe at least a lot of exciting new companies are emerging right now. And that's why we've invested already in two very exciting climate tech funds uh, as part of our portfolio, and will continue to do, the, do so as part of our really core strategy. Um, uh, some there's another good question here from the audience. I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but where yeah. do you see um, CO2 certificates as an uh, as an investment case? Uh, is this one something that you look into? To be honest, um, I'm not a big expert in that. Uh, I think based on the let's say the media and and the current situation, what people are discussing, this might definitely become relevant. So I mean, also people I meet uh, in the impact space have a focus on decarbonization. I think definitely there is a market for that, 100%. Uh, but you also again have to play it right. Uh, so for instance, if it comes to renewables, we have uh, invested into a wind farm last year in Germany, um, in uh, the North Sea which um, is definitely, I think, a very important critical infrastructure for Germany. But also here, um, there are some specialties that you have to consider. So for CO2 certificates, I do not have a personal opinion, but I think it's likely that this will 
play out well if if you uh, go for that. But we do at the moment not have an exposure in this regard. I have zero opinion on it. My expertise is venture. I stick to what I know. Um, so I can't really comment on this, but thanks for your for your insights on this. We are slowly getting to the end of the of our scheduled session here, Chris. Yeah. Um, maybe some some advice for for fund managers or even startups that want to reach out to you or want to partner with you. What is the best way um, to partner with you and to reach out? I mean, I frankly, especially in, in a time right now um, where we have, you know, AI and, and software everywhere, I think I believe in personal relationships. So I, I think especially in our industry, um, the relationship angle will never be replaced, right? So the way we met first time, second time, third time and so on, this cannot be replaced by anything. Um, and therefore, I, I believe really strongly in uh, meeting up and just, you know, having a good chat about comparing notes, what can you do together? How can you maybe partner, co-invest? We, we like that. We, we uh, typically do co-investments. We uh, offer co-investments because we want to help our own companies. Uh, and um, we definitely believe in also conferences. So I personally, I'm a big fan of uh, the Prestel conference format, Prestel and Partner, which is uh, especially for family offices, um, where you can really meet your peers and exchange about uh, current best practice, how do you invest, how can you maneuver through risks and so on. And last but not least, I mean, LinkedIn does definitely also uh, open some doors, although the problem is the funneling here because you get a lot of messages that are not really clear or you don't have the time for it. So at the end of the day, it's about FaceTime. So I'm looking forward to, to see you again in person, Stefan. <laughs> You're invested already. I appreciate that. I always love okay. hanging out. <laughs> But we had one more question about um, generally emerging managers, right? I mean, yes, we talked about track record, et cetera. I mean, we have our own opinion. We love emerging managers. What is your opinion on emerging managers and maybe a piece of advice to them raising their first fund from your experience also going to these events, speaking to other family offices? What can an emerging manager do to you know, build a great fund, to raise it quickly, to focus on their portfolio? I think, so, I mean, it's definitely a challenge because uh, you have to convince people of something that maybe you have not proven yet. So first of all, I would say, show some skin in the game. That's what we also always do. So if we are looking for a cap raise of a company, then it's already in our portfolio. So we only put, we say, put the money where your mouth is. And yeah. I think that's also, that's the same for an emerging manager, put a substantial amount of your personal capital depending on how much it is, but let's say really a substantial chunk of it in percent into your own fund, show skin in the game. And from there, you have to go for a lot of kilometers on the road, drink coffee and maybe also other drinks. So that's, <laughs> I think that's something that is not avoidable. Again, FaceTime, get to know the right people and hang out. Yeah, uh, I agree, right? I think on one hand, we are obviously super data driven, right? We can afford this. We are tech founders also from our background. So it's yeah. not it's not that we just believe in relationship, at least from our investment uh, side. Yeah. Um, but it's also important to be able to scout the market, right? I think there's the market is so fragmented. There are 14,000 VC funds, maybe 20,000 if you look globally. Um, yes new emerging managers are coming up um, luckily not as fast as at the peak of the bubble but still relatively fast um, and they all reach out to you they all they look very similar uh, in the in, in the initial reach outs so it's very very hard to distinguish the good from the great um, and that's why we are also working on a on a digital platform to solve this yeah to really yeah. Um, add to this physical um, relationship aspect that is important that the Presto conference that you mentioned is a fantastic way to get started uh, to to get in front of uh, some genuine family offices and and build these relationships but again being able to you know go in a platform for a family office and looking into ESG focused funds across Europe that are below 100 million in AUM right search parameters like this are extremely difficult uh, to do and usually the search mandates that can be done by consultancies they are focused on you know billion dollar plus fund yeah mm -hmm. so you're missing out on the complete exciting part of the ecosystem um, I really agree so that's something I, I really want to want to say because uh, 
What I meant was more for the fundraising side of an emerging manager, but looking at like how to identify the right ones, yes, that should be data driven. So, and if, if this is uh, your focus, I'm, I'm fully on your side because the market is quite large and it's not easy to identify the right ones just by coincidence, basically impossible. Yes, I, I agree. And um, we'll, we'll have something very exciting to share with everybody in a month about this when we, when we actually launch publicly with this. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've been working on this on our own operations for our own investment decisions. How do you keep an overview of, you know, 14,000, 20,000 funds in the world? How do you get first-hand data and not outdated stuff from uh, some other data platforms? And how do you then integrate this into processes, right, to really create value out of it? Um, so maybe final question. There's a, there's a nice question here to, to round this up that... Um, obviously, we also see this that a lot of business angels are starting to professionalize, right? So, if you, if business angels with a strong track record, with a unique access to deal flow, access to a network, right, to a community, um, from former you know unicorn founders or employees by a unicorn, uh, starting uh, to professionalize and building their own funds, um, is this the end of direct investing? Is that the question a bit provo provocative, maybe? Uh, I think that it's very unlikely that direct investing will come to an end. I think it's important to to play, let's say, all cards that you have, right? So especially if you look at larger institutions and you have to have a certain check size, you maybe want to go direct because then you can cut the best deal. But of course, funds are very relevant, especially if coming back to the headache, if you don't want to have headache. So if you are able yeah. to identify the right fund managers, then you already have won a lot. Because even if you pay for that at the end of the day, I only care about net results. So if you have appealing yeah. net results and no headache, I think everybody's happy. Yeah, 100% agree. And I think it's really a coming down to understanding startup life cycles, right? Which stage are you investing? Which areas, et cetera? So, and, and where's the deal flow coming from, right? Direct investing as an angel pre-seed on a you know PowerPoint um, with usually a, at least four million pre-money these days, right? Sometimes yeah. even higher with serial entrepreneurs. Um, you know these are expensive PowerPoint decks, yeah. And there you can really <laughs> um, get nothing in return if you're unlucky, and if you don't have the right access to the right deal flow community network, yeah. To, to play this, I think it's very very risky to do pre-seed seed. seed Direct investing is extremely risky if you don't have professional partners like a good fund or fund of fund on your side. And then direct investing at later stages. So you're once you're getting to series B, C, D, right? Yes. Then I think it starts to not become easy for sure, but it becomes much more comparable to private equity investing because the companies usually have data to, to take it an investment decision, right? You, you, you don't have to rely on your gut feeling of the founder of an yes. unproven sure. high-end, high-tech market that you don't understand fully, but you usually have a proven business with some sort of KPIs and numbers you can value. And that's becoming significantly easier if you have the right team. To be honest, my opinion was also more for companies where you see at least a certain traction. But if you go really very early, then the risk of losing it all is high. And uh, so you either diversify like crazy, but also this is something a fund can do better. So I'm thinking direct investing makes sense if you have substantial capital to deploy, firstly. And secondly, if you look at a company which, which has shown that it can deliver, right? So you need certain turnover, yeah. you need a, a product that is suitable for the market and so on. Uh, and then you just need a little bit of imagination where could the road lead, but you need to see the road at least. You should be on the road already, yeah. not somewhere in the forest. And the same is true for funds, by the way. Again, the question earlier about emerging managers, we also look for emerging managers who do their first close um, sooner, rather do it a little bit smaller, start investing, start building up the portfolio proof in the smallest way possible what you set out to do versus just aiming for something that just may take a very long time and then you, you kind of, you know, you never get there. Yeah. It's baby steps. Fully agree. Nice. Well, it's been a blast. Thanks everybody for the uh, for the great questions and um, very very full audience. I know it's uh, early August. Everybody is 
probably either uh, dialing in from Saint Tropez or Ibiza. So um, <laughs> I wish <laughs> only I, you I and wish. I at the desk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I wish, yeah. I wish so too. <laughs> <laughs> sitting sitting in rainy Munich and Zurich. But um, Chris, thanks a lot for all your insights and thanks a lot uh, for taking the time. Um, we'll send out the recording to everybody afterwards. Have a wonderful Thank day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank Stefan. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.